What is the measurable chance that he resigns before the end of his term, including but not limited to the purpose of at least an attempted self-pardon? I think a self-pardon is far more likely, and I'm basing this on sources, not speculating, Brian. I believe a self-pardon is far more likely than a resignation. You know this president. I know this president. Your past panel knows this president. He's not a guy who's going to walk away willingly. And obviously, his relationship with the vice president can't be more strained based on the rather uh, locker room conversations they're having and the epithets that at least Donald Trump is throwing at the vice president. It's hard to imagine he resigns with the warm hope that the vice president pardons him, although he might do it. I really, really doubt that. I also would like to add to one of the great concerns here that connects your question with Tom's remark. The president has relied on stoking this group's anger, whether they be ex-military, current military, law enforcement officers. He has stoked their anger that America is not um, caring about them. And he has relied on it almost like a, like a dog whistle, but worse. It is the thing that makes him feel full and loved to have this group charge onto the Capitol grounds. He was watching that on live TV with a little bit of happiness, according to his aides. It's really shocking. And another thing that's really shocking is that Metropolitan Police Department officers who rushed to this complex to protect it, to help their colleagues, the Capitol Police, who were getting their heads bashed in with pipes, with bike rack, they saw people they knew were police officers in the group. They knew that some of these people were ex-military, off-duty cops. What is that saying about the division within our own country if the thin blue line has blue on one side and blue on the other? It's really terrifying, and you have to, you have to look at how the president has encouraged that and egged it on. I want to get you on the record. The CDC changed up uh, the rules a little bit today. They want to um, put people, all people over 65, at the new head of the new line. And I am assuming you view this as a good step. We certainly need to be speeding up the distribution of the vaccination process. We're simply not going fast enough right now. And by adding people who are over 65, not necessarily ahead of healthcare workers or long-term care facilities, but alongside them, I think that's a really important step. And then it's really up to states to figure out how to implement that on the ground. Dr. Jha of uh, Brown University was on television today urging states uh, not to uh, bog this down in bureaucracy and paperwork, reminding everybody the job is herd immunity. The job is enough shots in enough arms of enough Americans. Um, and that brings us to Joe Biden. He's made a, uh, a bold pledge, 100 million shots in his first 100 days. He has also said he is willing, unlike the current president, to marshal all the resources of the presidency. So are you optimistic he will be able to hit that goal? Look, right now, with 4,000 people dying a day, we don't really have a choice. This is unacceptable that you have more people dying every day that died on 9-11. And if you continue to see those kinds of numbers, it won't, it won't take that long, not even that first 100 days, before we end up doubling the death toll. So the president-elect is very committed to getting those 100 million shots into people's arms by 100 days. Final question. Folks watching tonight, let's say ages 40 to 60, otherwise good health, give a ballpark date. Is there a month? Is there a season of 2021 where they can expect the line will get to them? You know, this is a, a bit of a crystal ball kind of situation, but my best guess would be late spring, perhaps early summer, uh, that we would be getting to those healthy people, uh, middle-aged people uh, who don't have chronic medical conditions. But we have a lot of work to do between now and then.
Well, good evening once again. Day 1454 of the Trump administration, eight days until the inauguration of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. As we come on the air tonight, as has been noted in our live coverage, the House is taking the first of two votes to try to remove Donald Trump from office. Voting is already underway in the House right now on this resolution calling on Vice President Pence to invoke the 25th Amendment. But the vote is only symbolic because Pence already said he's not going to do it, even though he refused to do Trump's bidding when it came to overturning the, re the election. Peter Baker and his colleagues at The New York Times report on the blow up between Trump and Pence last Wednesday, shortly before Pence headed to the Capitol. The Times quotes Trump as warning his ardently loyal sidekick, quote, you can either go down in history as a patriot or you can go down in history as a and here the president uses his go to P word. Earlier tonight, Pence sent a letter to Speaker Pelosi explaining his refusal to invoke the 25th Amendment against his boss. It reads in part, quote, I do not believe that such a course of action is in the best interest of our nation or constituent with our const consistent with our Constitution. I urge you and every member of Congress to avoid actions that would further divide and inflame the passions of the moment. Well, the second vote is expected in the House sometime tomorrow. That would be the vote to impeach Donald Trump for a second time. As more House Republicans join that effort tonight, it seems certain the president will be impeached by the House again by this time tomorrow night. Tonight, nearly one week after the attack on the Capitol, Trump finally talked to reporters. He took questions on the role that his words played in setting off the bloody insurrection that took five lives, including that of a police officer. A week ago, Trump urged his supporters to walk down to the Capitol, saying they needed to fight like hell to show strength. Here is what Trump said today before leaving Washington for a trip to Texas to tout what's been built of his border wall. People thought that what I said was totally appropriate. And if you look at what other people have said, politicians at a high level, about the riots during the summer, the horrible riots in Portland and Seattle and various other, other places, that was a real problem. They've analyzed my speech and my words and my final paragraph, my final sentence, and everybody to the T thought it was totally appropriate. Tonight, there are significant cracks in the once seemingly impenetrable red wall of support that Republicans built around Donald Trump. The Senate majority leader is now breaking with Trump, it would seem. The New York Times reporting Mitch McConnell, quote, has told associates that he believes President Trump committed impeachable offenses and that he is pleased that Democrats are moving to impeach him, believing that it will make it easier to purge him from the party. The Times piece continues. Representative Kevin McCarthy of California, the House Minority Leader and one of Mr. Trump's most steadfast allies in Congress, has asked other Republicans whether he should call on Mr. Trump to resign. At least four House Republicans, Liz Cheney, the number three ranking Republican in the House, along with Congressman John Katko, Adam Kinzinger and Fred Upton, have all said they will, in fact, cross over and vote to impeach Trump. Cheney, of course, the daughter of Dick Cheney, her statement said in part, quote, there has never been a greater betrayal by a president of the United States of his office and his oath to the Constitution. Today, Trump tried to frame this fast moving impeachment push as just part of an ongoing campaign against him. The impeachment hoax is a continuation of the greatest and most vicious witch hunt in the history of our country and is causing tremendous anger and division and pain far greater than most people will ever understand, which is very dangerous for the USA, especially at this very tender time. As the investigation into the Capitol attack continues, The New York Times reports federal authorities had warned the president about the possibility of violence the Sunday before the riots last Wednesday. The Times writes, quote, top officials in government had reason to be deeply concerned about the possibility of violence. The indications included a pair of FBI reports that warned of war and blowing up a building at a Midwest statehouse and a White House meeting where 
President Trump and top military officials discussed deploying the National Guard. And the Washington Post reports the day before, January 5th, an FBI office in Virginia warned extremists were preparing to travel to Washington to commit violence and war. The Post reports an internal bureau document noted online discussions of violence saying, quote, be ready to fight. Congress needs to hear glass breaking, doors being kicked in, get violent. Stop calling this a march or rally or a protest. Go there ready for war. We get our president or we die. 